So welcome everybody um, to our roundtable on decolonizing art and praxis in the time of COVID-19. My name is Abraham Ramirez. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Ethnic Studies and the Program in Critical Theory at UC Berkeley. And I'm also the, currently the editor of Revista No, the online publication of the Latinx Research Center. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Latinx Research Center. Uh, it's a interdisciplinary and trans-America's research hub at UC Berkeley. The LRC's general mission is to support the research and the policies that address the complex and diverse Latinx experience in the US and abroad, as well as supporting research that sheds light and moves action and discussions forward on the myriad of factors that affect the distribution of material, cultural, social, and the political opportunities in our communities. Uh, please visit our website uh, if you want. Uh, if, you, if you want more information, visit our website at lrc.berkeley.edu, and there you can subscribe to our newsletter, uh, where we send out information on events uh, throughout the year and throughout the semesters. Um, so check that out if you want more information about the LRC and um, and events that we have uh, going on the rest of the semester and for next year. So also um, a big welcome to all of you to uh, Revista, Nox, Revista Nox first public event. Uh, you can also find the Revista at revistanox.berkeley.edu. Uh, the Revista, is, it's, uh, it's the, like I said, the LRC's online publication. It's a project that's designed uh, to be a hub for Latinx intellectual discussion on culture and politics. We're currently in our initial stages, but uh, the general structure of the publication is designed to, uh, to print online uh, original commentaries and analysis uh, with which each themes, each issue's theme, but uh, we also run a constant flow of information from various sources on all things Latinx from art, film, media, to politics. And we have in the works also a series of columns that should be ready to uh, be, launch, be launching next year. So check that out. Uh, it's, a, it's, in its, it's in its initial stages, but I think that um, uh, you, you'll, you'll get a lot from it. Um, and this event is a precursor to our upcoming uh, second issue uh, which is going to be published November 1st on decolonial art and aesthetics. And the idea for this is uh, it came actually uh, quite suddenly and forcefully as, uh, and it was inspired in large part as a result of the protests after the George Floyd uh, murder by police and the, the protests in Oakland uh, and, and, and as a result of the protest, the murals that came up, uh, we, we were in the process of constructing a theme and we scrapped it. There was, there was no other way. Uh, there was, um, we had really no other choice but to run a series on art and decolonial art at that. Um, we, we started, we rushed together and we, we formulated a theme and actually, um, what I wanted to do was to quickly run through some of the murals. Those, those of you who don't know, who aren't from Oakland or from the Bay Area, um, Oak, uh, during the protest, Oakland uh, essentially turned into a outdoor museum. It, it, it's, it's currently still, uh, you have murals and art everywhere. Um, one of the ironies was that as a result of the, uh, of the anticipation of the protests, like any you know, city that, that, that you know, fears protests and, and, and de democratic participation, you have uh, businesses throughout cities boarding up their, their windows, boarding up their doors. And it really, it, it really um, it makes the place look ugly, in my opinion, with, with boards everywhere. And the irony here is that artists, throughout the Bay Area saw this as an opportunity to, to claim the space. So what was supposed to be a representation of the fear and, and that, 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 uh, that, that um, 
um, the, the, the xenophobia or the fear of, of, of the protest became something beautiful. And I, I was touched. It, it really inspired me. Um, I actually, I, want, I, I thought about this a couple hours ago. Those of you who aren't from the Bay Area don't, uh, don't have the opportunity to, to see it. So I did want to actually just quickly share, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I wanted to share some of this, this art and just quickly, just quickly go through it so that we can get a sense of uh, what inspired Revista, uh, uh, Noch's uh, second issue. So here we have um, several images. I'm gonna just quickly go through them. Um, but essentially the, the entire city, the downtown turned into an open air, free of charge museum, an incredible place. Um, and I spent hours there taking pictures with, uh, uh, with colleagues um, because of course they're gonna be taken down at some point. So you have, you have I'm talking about hundreds. I could, we couldn't even take pictures of everything. It, it, just, be, it just, it was tr radically transformed virtually overnight. And I love the, the, you can see the kind of the, the vision that these uh, artists and the message that they're trying to uh, uh, get out here. And you have, you have, um, you know, many stories being told you have solidarity across racialized groups. Um, you have art that's just phenomenal that it should never be taken down. I don't think any of these should be taken down, but inevitably here you have a, like a word search with the names. If you read closely, you can find the names of people who've been murdered by the police. You, have, you can see Black Lives Matter there. It's just amazing work. And these are, these are enormous. They are they they are take up entire buildings. Here you have a a tribute to the to the monuments movement that was taking down the white supremacists and replacing it with with actual stories of uh, resistance. This one's interesting here, um, the Chilean dog riot dog. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Pablo Gonzalez at, at, at uh, Ethnic Studies Changemakers, who's, who's uh, creating virtual uh, uh, AR uh, um, uh, artwork. So if you have an app called Artivive, you can point it at this screen and on your app, it will be a, a footage of the, of the actual dog, which is incredible work that he's doing there, but okay. So I just wanted to quickly show that um, because that, ins that, that really inspired the, uh, the, oh, what am I doing here? Sorry. My screen. screen. Yeah, I, w I really wanted to show that so uh, folks who, who are not from the Bay Area can get a sense of what's really happening uh, um, throughout cities uh, uh, across America. But the kind of response that, that artists and uh, uh, muralists um, uh, are how they're responding to these, the current crisis, which, which led me to, you know, to think about the possibility of art and historically uh, the role that art has played. And as a result, we conceived this event, um, thanks to uh, the, the chair, uh, Laura Perez, we conceived of this event to kind of have a precursor to our issue and have a discussion about decolonial aesthetics with experts who uh, have been doing this work for a long time. So uh, we have, a, we have these speakers here that I'm going to introduce. First, we have um, Jesus Barraza, 
who is an interdisciplinary artist with an MFA in social, uh, uh, in, uh, with an MFA in social practice and masters in visual critical studies from the California College of Arts. He's also the co-founder of Dignidad Rebelde, a graphic arts collaboration that produces screen prints, political posters, multimedia projects, and he's a member of the Just Seeds Artists Cooperative, a decentralized, uh, uh, a cooperative, a decentralized uh, cooperative in Me that also is uh, transborders Mexico and U.S. And he's also a cult, uh, lecturer in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Also, we have with us Mauricio Bajos de Castro. Uh, he's an author of three books on Afro-Brazilian popular culture, and is published in AM Journal of Art and Media Studies. Uh, and African and Black Diaspora, an international journal. He's uh, currently a professor at Rio de Janeiro State University, and his areas of expertise include interdisciplinary perspectives on contemporary art, Black popular culture, African diaspora, and Afro-Latinx history. And also we have Isela La Torre, uh, he's an author of uh, the book, Democracy on the Wall, Street Art of the Post-Dictatorship Era in Chile, and Walls of Empowerment, Chicana Chicano Indigenous Murals from California. She specializes in modern and contemporary US Latinx and Latin American art with a special emphasis on Chicana Latina feminism. And also lastly, we have uh, Dr. Laura E. Perez, who is uh, the author of a uh, new book, Eros Ideologies, Writings on Art, Spirituality, and, Decolon and the Decolonial. And also of uh, Chicana Art, The Politics of Spiritual and Aesthetic Alterities. She curated UC Berkeley's first and only US Latina Latino performance art series. She co-curated curated the multimedia ex exhibition, Chicana Bad Girls, Las Osiconas, and curated labor and art, Oreo, Bay Area Latino Arts Now. She's a professor in ethnic studies and the current chair of the Latinx Research Center at UC Berkeley. Um, so before we get to them, uh, I'm just gonna kind of outline the structure of the event. We're gonna have some guiding questions and then the panelists, uh, about four guiding questions, the panelists will have maybe like five to 10 minutes to answer uh, each question um, respectively. And, I hope that the questions kind of generate an organic feel, um, a roundtable discussion between all of them. They get to ask each other other questions that you know come up um, uh, as a response to their answers. But after about uh, say one hour or so, uh, we can uh, and we give it the, each panelist enough time to kind of flesh out the, and present their thoughts. We'll move forward and integrate the rest of the participants in a in a Q and A session. So those of you who are um, uh, participating but are not are not panelists you can you can at any point you can uh, ask questions uh, just put them on the chat and I'll be able to see them um, so that you don't forget you know what you want to ask but then when we get to the Q&A questions I can then present them to the uh, to the panelists um, so um, so we'll start with the first question actually what I'll do is I'm gonna read all the questions so that we get an idea of what we're going and then we can start uh, with, the, with the, any of the panelists volunteering to go first. The first one is, what do you each, how do you each, or what do you each understand by the concept decolonial aesthetics? Two, what do you think has historically characterized decolonial art? And how do you see the art world responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? What is the current political and social crisis doing in the arts world to artists, to their communities, and therefore to their art and to the art spaces. So then, uh, and to add to that, what kind of art do, you, do are we seeing from this? Uh, what kind of art is happening? What's going on in museums, galleries, in the streets, in the houses? Are we seeing a particular form of creativity and strategy or is digital uh, and is, is digital culture surfacing new modes of community building, critique, solutions, expressions of reality? And do we have access to these? Um, three, along these same lines, I'd like to know uh, from the panelists, uh, have, 
who have been, actually been around protest movements for quite some time and organizing projects for, you know, for, for, for years, given your research and experience around art and art movements, how integral art, how, 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 has, how integral has art been to social movements in the past? And can you speak for a bit about the role art, decolonial aesthetics and art praxis is currently playing or should play in these particular, particularly uncertain times? Four, what can art offer in all its forms in the projects that uh, in the in, in in the projects that are currently building a vision for the future that we desire to construct whether we are going to live in that future or not H how do you see art or what what kind of uh, um lens or critique or or political strategy can art offer so, uh, in in the in, in these in the building of these visions so we'll start from the top uh how do you, each of you understand the concept of decolonial aesthetics? Any, any, uh, it's open to any of you. Um, um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so, uh, so I think um, decolonial aesthetics for me is a form of, of creative, uh, but also kind of so a creative expression, but also a social political practice that really. Um, uh, uh, connects the idea of imagination and creativity uh, as a way to imagine a different world. And so I think that if we think of the coloniality as, uh, you know, as that, that goes beyond the colonial and even beyond the post-colonial and goes into the realm of, of creating new visions, I think art is particularly well suited for that. And so for me, the idea of creativity and imagination that we think is so central to art um, uh, is becomes the kind of um, uh, the springboard to imagine a different world, different social relations, and and that's I think um, how I would see, uh, you know see that connection between decoloniality and aesthetics. Um, uh, and in in terms of my own kind of practice or my own research rather. Um, uh, for me, uh, uh, you know, decolonial art and decolonial expression are those that happen not only uh, outside of structures of power, but uh, or or that could happen outside of structures of power, but also kind of push against those structures of power. Um, and that is an art that is engaged in you know in people's lives. That is not necessarily this idea of the art for art's sake that exists only because of itself. Um, and so those are some kind of like ideas uh, maybe to get the ball rolling. I may think of other things. There's so much to say about that, but I'll maybe I'll pass the baton over. And I have to say I'm so excited to be here and to be in this panel with, with all these incredible thinkers and, and you know and artists. And so I'm I'm just beyond myself here from Ohio. <laughs> Um, can I jump in a little bit? Um, I have I have some yes, some slides I wanted to do. Can I can I share that? Yes, I believe uh, all the panelists have the ability to share. Oh, I can't share. Uh, there we go. Okay, you know, I, I wanted to to take it back a little bit because I, I think to me, I, you know, this is something and I've been thinking a lot and, and especially as as I've been looking to um the the piece that i'm i'm writing for the upcoming issue right and to me it's it's really looking at um it's really looking at what what it is you know for me that 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 we can think about as as decolonial art right and and for me it's it's almost been uh, sorry i'm having a little problem with my share uh you know taking it back taking it back. And when I say I taking it back, I try, try to take it way back, way back, way back, you know, because I've, I've been looking a lot at, you know, to me, when, when I'm thinking about the decolonial and especially around decolonial aesthetics, I think, you know, how did, how did the aesthetics get colonized, right? How is it that we're thinking about the, the, the colonized aesthetic, right? And to me, it, it's something that, that goes way back. And I've been thinking a lot, to me, I, 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 think, to, can, I, I think about connecting it to who we are as a people, uh, specifically uh, as Chicanx folk, as 
as people who are in the process of recovering our indigeneity, right? So to me, I think that that's really, you know, where, where I've been thinking about, right? And so to me, when looking at art, you know, it's really been the way that I've been try able to explore this question and thinking about, you know, what is it that, that brought us to the point where our art was colonized, right? And to me, I go all the way back, right? I think recently my, my research interest has, has been really around the, the first hundred years of the colonial period in Mexico and thinking about what was happening then, right? And so we look back and we, you know, we think about, you know, the, basically the, um, the society that was set up, right? We, we, we look back and we understand that there was an apartheid system that was set up, right? Where the Spanish, basically set up their, their own community and allowed other people to set up their own community, right? And I think as part of this, there was a whole um, point of conversion, right? And basically undoing all of the old ways, right? All of the people's um, ways. And so when we start looking at that, we start to think about what was happening during that period, right? So one of the things in, in reading some of Serge Gershinsky's books um, in, in Images at War, he talks about people who were hiding, who were burying their bundles, their spiritual bundles. They were starting to, to they, they knew that things were going to change. And they hoped that in a few years, they would be able to dig up those, those bundles, to dig, dig out those sacreds that they were burying. Because they, they thought they had this idea that within a few years, you know, the Spanish would leave and they would be able to get back to their old ways. And, and that wasn't what happened, right? It, those, those bundles, you know, wherever they're at, they're, they're, in some way, they're still buried. They've become part of the earth, right? And I'm not even talking about, you know, the stuff that's been uh, dug up in, in by the Temple of Mayor. I'm talking about people who buried their personal things, right? And so to me, when I look back, I start to think about, you know, what was it? What was the aesthetics that we had back then, right? We have, we were making things, right? And I think that when we think about, you know, making and, and doing, right, we, we start thinking about, you know, the aesthetics and we start thinking about what people were doing and how this was connected to their lives. And so, we, you know, we can look at a lot of things, but one of the things I've, I've started to look at is a feather work, right? And I think to me, um, the, the, the Mexica feather work that came out of, out of this society was something that was really important to the people. This is a shield, right? And we can see it in a lot of different ways, right? And to me, what I started to think about is what happened here, right? What happened when people started to lose their way of making, right? They started to basically, um, to have to make things for the other, right? I, and part of my research has really been how, how did we lose our, our aesthetics, right? How was our, our, our aesthetics colonized? And we see that as, you know, as in, uh, Hernan Cortes talks about the Mexica and one of the first things he did is, is he had to make stuff, is he had to make stuff. He, he, he has them create basically bootlegs of European art using Mexica uh, aesthetics. And so this is, you know, th this is one of those pieces that was made. This is um, a feather painting that was done by a Mexica using the same techniques that were put into this, into this shield, right? And this shield that was basically from the, the pre-colonial period, right? So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the way that aesthetics became colonized, the way that basically our way of making things for our people, for ourselves, were taken away. And all of a sudden we started to, to use represent, representation uh, you, through art to make something for the other, right? And so there, there was a, there's a lot of cases that, like this that you can see. And it's funny because one of the things that Hernan Cortez says is that the Mexicas were really good at making stuff and, and making copies of the things that they were presenting them with. And this goes back to like the bootlegs. This is where we get the original Mexican bootlegs here, right? But these were the things that, that we started to see as, as, uh, as, our, as, as our way of making was colonized, right? And, and it's, you know, this is going back to the 1590s. This is within the first hundred years of the colonial period, right? And, and we look, you know, it, it takes a long time for, for the artists. We look at basically, and, and we can see the, the, you know, quote unquote, mestizo artists who were uh, making the cast paintings, right? We, we can look at Miguel Cabrera and the work that he was making. Basically, you know, uh, uh, an indigenous artist who was making work that was representing this, this kind of um, dehumanizing hierarchy that had been set up by the Spanish, right? And so we look to that, we see how long it took for us to be able to get back to that. And, and we start to see in the late 1800s, we have the painting school in Mexico City that, that finally, you know, the professor says, what, what, if, what if we make things that reflect us? And, and I wish I had more time to get into that, but he, he's really in, in, in before the Porfirismo, he's the first one that really starts saying, Let, let's make paintings about our history. Right, and we see this, and because of Porfiarismo, that, that, that whole idea gets taken out, right? And it, all of a sudden that comes back in the 1920s with Diego Rivera and, and, and so on, right? Who all of a sudden started to look back to Mexican history. As problematic as, as the, the work that they were making was, 
uh, when we think about representations of contemporary indigenous people, right? But, but still there was, there was an artwork that was being created that was being informed by indigenous lineage, right? So we start to see slowly, but surely there's, there's this, this moment of decolonization that happens within the arts. And to me, it's really as we get into here in the United States, right? Because it's always about us here, right? Uh, just kidding there. But, you know, as we get into the, the Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx movement in the 1960s, we see that all of a sudden there's this moment where people start to, to do that research into who they are. And, and this comes at, at basically as a reaction of, of having all of that suppressed, of having their history suppressed, of having who they are suppressed, of basically being told that they are a people with no history that all that they should do is basically assimilate into the U.S. society and become, you know, part of the U.S. machine, right? But that doesn't happen because we have artists who start to do that research. And it comes slowly, right? Because we have people who start looking at the books. They start, we can look at the work of Rupert Garcia where he's, and Juan Puentes, artists, who start to take the symbols that they find, right? They start to find these symbols and they start to incorporate in the art. And it's, it's this work of decolonization that starts to happen. The, the point that I really see as being magical is, is a few years later. In the late 70s, Yolanda Lopez starts to do research around the Virgen de Guadalupe, who we have pictured here on the right. You know, she starts to do that research. And, and this is the start of a whole body of work that she creates. And she's really well known for her, her series of the, of, the, of the Tres Virgens, of her as a Virgen, her mom, and her grandmother as a Virgen, right? But I think to me, the piece that was just magical was this piece that we have here in the center, the Nuestra Madre, a piece that was done at the Galeria La Raza during their, their inside exhibition. And to me, I look back to this piece because it, it's, it's really the moment where she takes her research and, and the research started with the Virgen Guadalupe, but it, as she, she talks about it, it went into Pualique and it went into the, the Mexica cosmology because that's where the Virgen comes from, right? As we look back to, to you know, the, the decolonial aesthetic, you know, the, colon, the colonizing of our aesthetics and it's also the colonizing of our being, the colonizing of our spirituality, right? Which are all connected. You know, when we're thinking about aesthetics, we can't take those apart. It's, and that's, I think, you know, where we really have to understand where it's all connected to spirituality. I'm sorry, I'm talking so fast. I just want to get through some of the stuff. But what we start to see is that, you know, when we have the Virgen come up, the Virgen appears to Juan Diego as a way of continuing that, that legacy of being able to pray to the Mother Earth, right? To the Mother Goddess, the Mother Earth Goddess, to the two. Tetaunan, right, as, as, we, as we can kind of understand her. And so there, there's this moment where the Virgen de Guadalupe takes over the work of the Cualique, as we see here on the right, right, the Mother Earth Goddess. And to me, the way I see Yolanda kind of approaching the work here is that she starts to do that research, and, and that takes a, that, that kind of that, that act, that, that act of doing that unburying, right, of digging all of those things that were buried during the colonial period, right? And, you know, in, in a way, you know, we, we see the the, the Kualikwe kind of is, is, is unearthed at some point in history, but, but, you know, she starts to do that research and starts to bring up all these things. And we see here what she comes up with. And to me, I see this painting um, as, as, as really taking on that work, as being able to kind of uh, unearth our own history, of being able to, uh, to undo what had been done and, and take out those sacred bundles. And, present them to our communities again. I love the way Yolanda talks about her work as not just belonging to herself, but belonging to her community. And so in that way, the way I, I see this is that she was basically, um, she basically unburied that bundle for us and she shared it with the community. And she, she helped us understand that we were at a point where we could return to these ways. And that to me, I think is, is, is a decolonizing of the aesthetics. But she helped us understand that as, as a Chicanx people, we can go back to our old ways. You know, we can go back to praying to the Kualikwe, to the Mother Earth Goddess. And to me, these are the, the little things, right? I think to me, that's a decolonizing of the aesthetic, right? Is that we're able to return to these things, right? We're, we're looking at, you know, 1976, you know, the year that I was born, um, it was still illegal to, to, to pray in, in traditional ways here in the United States, right? The peyote ceremony was illegal, right? It wasn't until... Uh, 1978 that the Religious Act was passed and we were able to go back to that, right? And so this is really, you know, part of that work that was happening of being able to, to find who we are and to connect to it and, and, and do it through, to me, do it through the artwork. And I'll stop there. I have some other, some other stuff I'll share, but um, to me, that's what I think, you know, when we go to the decolonial, it's really about reconnecting to who we are. And we have some examples of other artists, you know, contemporary artists who are doing that. 
And that is, you know, as I think, you know, and we'll get to that. I also have some, some examples of that in, in Oakland that we can see how artists have decolonized and are going back to, to indigenous traditions to really show who it is that they are. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in because um, because a couple of things in what Jesus, what you've said, I think um, uh, it would be useful to kind of like scaffold them a little bit. I also just want to say, um, you know, that I appreciate both, you know, a lot of, you know, with, uh, Gisela, you know, you really emphasize it when we're when we're thinking about aesthetics and art that's decolonial, this stuff is definitely not about some inherited depoliticized sense of art for art's sakes. And Jesus, I thought, you know, you did such a beautiful job of like in organizing that slideshow to kind of talk about that bundle that was hidden by the ancestors and how it has become, you know, through some artists at some moments kind of hidden, you know, and you talked about being able to return. And that made me want to jump in right now, just because I wanted to address something that critics who don't understand a decolonial politics that comes from peoples who have been oppressed in our current cultures and our ancestral cultures, you know, uh, Eurocentric, so you could be any color, any ethnicity, but still be very much within a Eurocentric way of understanding the world and art history. Um, and so you might just join dominant cultural art history and art thinking, which is like the rest of the university and say, well, you know, we're really sorry all these bad things happened, but they're gone, they're broken. Let's not be romantic. Let's not be nostalgic. Let's deal with, you know, political solutions for the moment. And so, you know, I think, I think that one of the things that, um, that the decolonial and not just decolonial aesthetics that it's always asking is what does it mean to be in a world and sometimes in a country like we are i think in latin america and in the united states because our cultures have, are so eurocentric at least in the dominant at the dominant levels and in terms of how we talk about art and those decisions have to do with what what is purchased and put in museums what is celebrated what is circulated and so i think it really matters to be able to think about that Eurocentricity, which we have had imposed and which we inherit, you know, as people who think about art and or people who make art, right, like Jesus, uh, we've been, what's been imposed has been like a worldview, a philosophy, a cosmology, a way of understanding life and reality. And therefore, of course, this thing that the West calls art and this this social role that the West calls artist, right? And within the West, within the last hundred plus years, interestingly with the rise of modernity and modernism, how fascinating that art becomes increasingly defanged, that its power becomes increasingly taken away. And this art for art's sake movement, you know, really is this pressure that art has to be about beauty. So sometimes people talk about aesthetics as if aesthetics just means beauty, instead of what are the rules of the game by which you make something called art, you know, or another way of talking about aesthetics is what is the logic of the style of that thing? What is its aesthetics? And so I just want to say kind of to wrap this up, um, one of the questions I think that we ask ourselves because we're within, so many of us are within at least at least dominant culture or at least two cultures, if we were able to be raised in a traditional culture as well, you know, the question that we ask is, um, how is it possible to think in a way that is not about the caricaturization, the claim that ancestral indigenous and third world cultures are fine, but they're primitive. They belong to like the early stages of humanity when Northern Europe, you know, also went through that phase, but like third world people are supposedly stuck there. And we the children, you know, of that era of, of you know, of we, we the children of, you know, colonization and neocolonization in wanting to learn and know about 
ancestries that are non-Western, the African diasporic, the indigenous, two of the most prominent, but there's also others, as if that wanting to know is some kind of romantic nostalgia. Oh, I wish we were back there. Well, for sure, we wish colonization hadn't happened and slavery for sure, right? But I think the decolonial is that question, like, is, you know, how can we also learn? And if we already know something, how can we circulate the worldviews, the cultures, especially when we're talking about aesthetics, that have to do with the, with the making of so-called art or something like it, and the role of the so-called artist. And what, what I think that looking at both African diasporic and different indigenous cultures of the Americas show us is that the so-called artist had so much more social authority and responsibility you know, the, the so-called artist was very often, you know, what in some cultures is called the shaman, what in some cultures is called the healer, what, you know, what was also maybe the intellectual, the historian, the one who, who, who passed on through oral storytelling or through other kinds of sign making, knots, glyphs, you know, weaving, uh, marking and painting on walls and on objects, passed on the knowledge from our ancestors. And so if we think about that, you know, the, the, our, our desire to, to know about in a respectful way about other ancestors uh, besides the Western, to want to know about that in itself is decolonial. And I think the spirit and the heart of that is against the racism and the stories, the fiction that was invented about so-called races and the so-called inequity of the races. I mean, those things are just fake. They're not even real science or, 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 or solid philosophy and aesthetics unless you're talking in a closed room to a bunch of people that are flattering themselves. So for me, it's a question mark. You know, and at the bottom of the question mark is a little shovel so that we can dig through, you know, these, these stories. Um, and, and so anyway, so much more to say, but I just felt like a good moment to jump in. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you, Laura, Abraham, for the invitation and to opportunity to uh, be here with uh, uh, all of you and what I think about um, uh, the decolonizing expression uh, of an aesthetic is uh, so similar uh, with the uh, the talks of uh, uh, of yours and and for me when I think on the colonial aesthetic I also think about uh, uh, if you will have coloniality of power, coloniality of knowledge, coloniality of uh, uh, being and gender, I think that for sure we also have uh, a coloniality of art. And so we can also think about uh, the colonial aesthetic because if we have a coloniality of art, we also can think on the colonial aesthetics. And uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, the idea of, uh, of the aesthetics as a, a Western philosophical concept. And uh, it was a, a comment about uh, this idea and uh, if we think on aesthetic, we can uh, also think that when we talk uh, of aesthetics, we uh, was already uh, colonized because we are thinking about a, a Western concept. But uh, we are in the, in the, living in a global connected world and at the same time it's a culturally hybrid world and i think we can imagine uh, that uh, even if uh, aesthetic is a uh, 
Western field of study, for example, in the philosophical field of the meaning of art, we can at the same time think that no Western populations, people can appropriate of this uh, concept of art, this concept of aesthetics, and so if they want to do it, they want to uh, show us uh, uh, an expression of uh, the colonial aesthetics. Here in Brazil, it's the same uh, if we think about art, uh, when we think that art is uh, also a Western concept, it didn't exist uh, for, uh, for example, indigenous cultures. And, but here in Brazil, uh, we have now a lot of uh, uh, indigenous contemporary artists that are doing contemporary art and for sure they are doing uh, the colonial contemporary art because they are uh, appropriated, uh, they are uh, using the art concept to fight against uh, races and against uh, all the exclusion uh, uh, and uh, at the same time the exclusion in the uh, art world. So what I uh, am thinking about uh, uh, coloniality of art, I'm thinking about the idea of uh, universal aesthetic, I'm thinking about the idea uh, that Laura comments about uh, uh, the primitivism uh, in the art, the belief in primitivism in art, the idea of authenticity and the representation of other non-Western cultures as exotic, for example. So, uh, and at the same time, the coloniality of art for me, uh, has a Eurocentric na a narrative of art history. And then uh, this Eurocentric narrative uh, make uh, invisible a lot of uh, non-Western uh, art, for example. So I think that is important when we, when we are talking about uh, the colonial aesthetics uh, as images produce it against this coloniality of art, but not only this, it's also uh, a way to uh, uh, decolonize uh, Eurocentric art history and to uh, make possible uh, a liberation. So for me, the colonial, uh, the colonial aesthetics, uh, it's important to uh, to have this this role of liberation and to to make possible uh, disconnect uh, with uh, ancestors, with spirituality, with uh, 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 questions uh, related to uh, a, a, the possibility of uh, writing. Uh, another uh, art history, and then at the same time, the idea of uh, solidarity and all this possibility to thinking, to expression, and, uh, and, to, and to get this idea of uh, liberation. So I think it's uh, some considerations in, in this way. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, anybody else, uh, we can circle back if anybody else wants to add more. Gisela, you wanted to add? Yeah, I'd yeah, like okay. to add a little more. As I was hearing my colleagues, I, all kinds of ideas started springing up. Um, and I, um, I mean, I wanted to also kind of underscore that when we're talking about decolonial aesthetics, um, especially in the present moment, you know, that, you know, we have to contend with the you know, the, the ways in which power and colonial power has used art uh, as, a, as a tool of, of 
of subjugation. If you, so I think uh, Jesus mentioned the Casta paintings. Um, you know, we can talk about then, you know, uh, uh, I think Abraham, you mentioned the um, uh, you know Confederate monuments. Um, we can think also of forms of architecture also that really kind of cement uh, you know colonial power and create uh, and promote hierarchies and erase you know uh, uh, the creative expressions of indigenous African descent people, um, and so. When I, when, uh, and so Jesus was talking about recovery, and when he was talking about recovery, I was thinking of healing uh, and how a decolonial art in the present moment needs to have that healing element. But it's kind of like a communal and highly politicized healing. And I know, Lauda, you've written about this. Um, and so if I think of our present moment, it's, it's hard to imagine an art that is not openly and uh, resistant to the, you know, uh, the racism and the white supremacy that is, you know, um, determining our lives right now in, in, in this really insidious ways. And so, uh, uh, so the, you know, so for me, healing is connected with radical action, it's connected with uh, um, uh, also with a sense of collectivity. Um, and so for me, that also needs to be part of the conversation uh, about the colonial aesthetics. I, I want to just leap back in uh, a teeny, teeny bit and just say, um, you know, yeah, thank you uh, for reminding us about healing because, you know, that for people who maybe aren't used to talking about healing, that could sound like, you know, from a, a patriarchal sexist culture culture, like, oh, we have to be so brainy. We cannot talk about healing, how feminine or how romantic. But I think that I think, I, I think about someone like Franz Fanon, who was an MD, he was a psychiatrist. And what he cared about was like, you know, not just like the anti-colonial struggle against, um, you know, against colonial powers. Of course, he cared about that too, literal freedom of colonies from colonizing imperial powers. But he thought so much about how we internalize all of this, and this is where I want to come back to you, Gisela, all of this wounding, fragmenting language that we and our ancestors, you know, our half-breeds are somehow like inferior and our cultures are somehow inferior. And you know, I think that even today, no matter how brave and tough we are, I think it's it's so human, as opposed to the dehumanizing of racism and sexism and homophobia and classism, it's so human to recognize that hateful, you know, language and messages wound us, and often when we're very little, and then we have to carry that forward into our lives. And so in that sense, it really makes so much sense when we see that the work of artists of color and other allied artists in different parts of the world, including here in the US, that they're part of their committed, part of their work in telling the truth about the, the value, the riches, the necessity of different cultures, including the non-Western, that has a healing function in helping us to reclaim uh, the humanity of our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors, our countries. You know, so I, I really love that you brought that into the conversation. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, you know, thank you, Laura. And I also, I guess, um, piggyback on what you were saying also, that I, I think that you know, if we're thinking about, you know, what it takes to do to engage in the colonial aesthetic, there's a certain bravery that is that is necessary because if you're dealing with all, you know, these sort of um, generations of uh, uh, colonial mentalities that were we, that we are raised with, then engaging in a decolonial aesthetic means that you have to deal with uh, your own internalized forms of colonialism. And I came out of an art history program and I was raised Catholic in, in, in Chile. So I've been doing a lot of like decolonizing of my own mind and it's like a lifelong uh, kind of project. And so so that healing comes with, with, with uh, uh, it necessitate, necessitates uh, bravery and courage that is, you know, a lot of times difficult to do, but uh, a necessary thing also. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I... I really love what word Lada was going uh, 
where you said that was going. I mean, I think that, that when, when we're looking at, at, at the decolonial, it's definitely um, connected to, to, you know, decolonial aesthetics, definitely connected to the healing. Um, what, what has been, I don't know if people have looked at um, the, the book that was published um, of Gloria Anzaldúa's work, uh, Light in the Dark, Luz en Oscuro. That's definitely, I think to me, it's, it's the first book that we have uh, uh, a Chicana uh, perspective on decolonial aesthetics. I mean, I think if you look at it, it's really the only book as, as Chicanx books that we have on, on, on aesthetics, you know, as a whole. And really that is, you know, the, the, the very definition of what she's trying to get to as, as a decolonial aesthetic is that we need to go back to healing. And I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna show from, uh, one, let me see if I can present. Um, I wanted to bring some, some work up because I think as, as we look at, you know, uh, as we talk about this, to me, I think, uh, I, as I, I was, you know, thinking about este, the work of Yolanda Lopez, I think that's what she was doing. She was, she opened the, this space up for healing, for the community to be able to re-enter this space uh, that had been taken from us, which was what was going on. And I, I, I've been looking at this work. This is part of the, the, the article that I'm writing. I'm looking at the work by Gina Paricio. Um, this piece that's going to be that that was part of the uh, Chica Next Futurity show at UC Davis last year. Uh, it's a piece I, I, I'm not going to say the 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 Nawa name, but it's it's titled "Caught Between Worlds." To me, I think this has been you know walking into that installation. The first time I, I saw it and seeing her install it, I was there when she was installing it and just looking at what she was doing. To me, I, I thought you know when we're thinking about decolonial aesthetics and healing, this is where it's at. This is you know to me, I think you know we saw that. What, what, Yola, what Yolanda did with this piece was basically bring, bring the Kualikwa back to us and, and put us on this road of, of, of healing, as, as was said. And I think what we've been able to do since then is, is to, you know, as I was saying early on, it was we were or incorporated symbols. It was, it was about the symbols and things that, that gave us pride in one sense, but also reconnected us to a worldview in a very slow way. But, you know, it was Yolanda that opened it up. And now what we're seeing is is that, you know, in the 70s, there was a move in, in the movement um, to go back to ceremony, right? So, you know, over the past 50 years, you know, we've gone from like, you know, going to church to now we go to peyote meetings, right? We go to sweat lodge, we go to, to, to these ceremonies that help, you know, transform our worldview. And in that is really about, you know, how, how do we see the art that comes out of this? So I, I look at this piece from Gina, um, that you know that that has this this one is, is is a ceremony to me. It's this this way of almost you know when we're thinking about the art world is and I, I look at the work of Celia Hernandez, Celia Herrera Rodriguez uh, as definitely uh, informing this kind of way of of uh, of as artists of you know fine artists of of working within the museum and taking these things to to these spaces, which is sometimes very difficult. I, I can't go into it too much, but you know it it almost becomes as uh, it sounds as, as something that. Um, it just doesn't make sense. How do you take how do you take an altar into the, the into the gallery, right? Into the white space, obviously the, the four white walls, right? But the, to me, I, I've looked at it as something, I, and, and this is a you know one of the things that always comes back to art in, in these spaces is that w this is really the only way that we can find it in so many ways, right? We can make art in, in nature, but it won't be able to be found. And so when we're looking at this, you know, we're seeing that we're into the into these spaces, and, and this was at UC Davis, right? And so it's a little bit different than like a, a major museum, right? But what we're looking at is this piece where Gina set up a ceremony for us to enter, right? And we see that from the beginning, even before entering it, she, she offers, she has a tobacco offering for us. She allowed the, the, the viewers to do a little tobacco prayer, to do a little prayer that they could post on this wall to help them understand that the, what, what was going on here was, was about about ceremony. And so once they enter, they, you, you see the, the Koyoshauki in the middle. And, and what, you know, and as, as I talked to her about this, I saw this and, and you have the, the four different Nawales around the, around the room, around the circle. And basically this is a prayer. And, and she, you know, she's confirmed this in her own way, you know, thinking about, you know, this is ceremony. This is a ceremony uh, of, of bringing back together the Koyoshauki, right? And I think this is what we're thinking about. You know, the Koyoshauki is, is a stand-in for us as a people who have gone through the trauma of colonization as, as was being brought up, right? We've gone 
through the trauma of being dismembered, of having everything taken from us, of having, you know, our very worldview stripped from us and replaced with a foreign one, right? That became ours, right? And so this is one of those things that as we think of, uh, of this as, as Chicanx people, it's, it's hard because we, we, we've almost, we've internalized the, col the, the colonialism in so many different ways and, and it's become part of us, right? We, we are Catholic, so many of us are Catholic and, and we're, we're, we're almost, we're Catholic in, in a way that is very different from European Catholicism, right? I, I, I think that in Mexico, we have an indigenous Catholic church. That's why we have the Virgen, right? She was a stand-in for Koyoshaki, I mean, for Kualikwa, sorry. And so as we look at this work, you know, it really becomes this kind of this act of healing. She's, she's inviting people. And what you can hear is the poetry that she has going on over the loudspeakers. And that's very soft as you walk in. You hear the drumming. You hear the, the poetry. You hear the ceremony that basically you walk into. And, and trying to bring us back together. And so to me, I think that's, that's one of the interesting things that's happening in the art world, that we have artists who are going into these spaces, whether it's you know, doing the work in public or within the, the museum or galleries. That, that are bringing ceremony in a way. And I think to me that ceremony is something that's healing. And to me, it's interesting because for a lot of the people that go in there, and, and to me, I think of the, art, the, the audience, you know, we think of the audience, and I know it's the art world, but the audience in the, in the artist's view is a young Chicanx folk, right? It's those people who have not been able to go to the sweat lodge, who have not gone to the peyote meeting. And this is the first time they go into that ceremony outside of the church. And to help them understand that there's something else out there, that there is another way to look at the world, to, to look at, at our connection with Mother Earth and our connection to healing and one that is tied to our indigenous ancestors and really thinking about, as we think about DNA and the way so people like John Trudell and even um, Gloria Zaldua talk about DNA as, as containing all those instructions that have been turned off. And, and it's through this kind of work, you know, when we talk about that healing, that's basically flipping all those switches in our DNA that turn back all of those original instructions that were left in there from our ancestors. They talk about it in science now, you know, that DNA basically contains all of the memories of the ancestors. And that's what's going on here, that the, this kind of artwork is flipping all the switches in our DNA that help us understand what it means to be in, in the circle, what it means to be in prayer, what it means to be connected to earth. And so to me, I think that that, that whole, you know, this discussion about healing is, is so right on because this is what's going on. And I think as, as we bring it back to what was happening in the streets of Oakland, that's what it was about, that the art there was acting as a healing space. And, and it, as, as Anzaldua talks about, it, it's almost as those artists were, were shamans in the streets and, and, and inciting the ceremony for people to go and be part of. And I think that's how, you know, we, we can look. And I have a, a piece that I'll, I'll talk about later um, from Trust Your Struggle that, that did that in, in a very specific way. Um, I, I'll jump in really briefly right now, um, Jesus, just to maybe we can connect, you know, to some of the other, you know, um, experiences that, that we also have. I'll just say this, that uh, people uh, sometimes when they see both indigenous and African diasporic, and I'll also say Asian American work that uses things like altars or invokes ancestors, that there's been some debate Right, I've read articles where people are saying, but, and even with actually with literature, like, but is it really a ceremony? Is it really religious? And some questions that can come from that are like, oh, is it appropriate if it is? Is it appropriate if it isn't? And I just, I will just say this, and I, then I'd love to hear, you know, what, what the rest of you think. I'll just say this, that in the book you mentioned, well, and you mentioned Gloria Saldua in Borderlands, she says, She's very inspired, if you look at her footnotes, as we nerds do, she's very inspired by a study of African masks. And she says, I don't want my book to be like, you know, this book that is defined by virtuosity from a Western perspective, like what a pretty novel, what a perfect poem, what a perfect, but she says she wants her book to be alive. And when I reread that, I think about what you've said, Jesus, that, that Gina Paricio's work as a minimum, well, I'm, you didn't say as a minimum, but I'm thinking como minimo as a minimum, that work is a prayer, you know, in the sense of that, that work has an intention, right? It's made with an intention to have a healing effect and a furthermore a decolonizing effect. And so I just wanted to listen more to, um, you know, Gisela, you've been on the street in, in uh, Chile 
right? And Mauricio, you've been working a lot with the African diasporic in Brazil and, and also looking at some art in the United States. And I think that in all these different spaces, that challenge about like, is art supposed to just be aesthetically whatever dominant culture and dominant culture avant-garde want it to be, you know, with its hair combed and wearing a radical shirt or whatever people think of as cutting edge art. Like when art is coming from an intention that has to do with, with addressing colonization, I think it asks itself different questions and it looks and feels differently. Thank you, Laura. Um, this is actually a great segue to the second question, which you just asked, uh, but I can, I can uh, 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 repeat for everybody. But I just wanted to say um, the discussion uh, uh, of healing and of, of decolonizing and of aesthetics is, uh, um, it kind of, I, I'm, I'm a philosopher, I'm not, I don't, I don't um, study art um, and I don't have a, a, a de in-depth research of, on art, but as a philosopher, I'm super interested in structures, right? And the structures of the mind and actual architectural structures. And, 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 and of course, you know, how, how the way a city is structured will, will, will influence even the way we think, right? So even the, the, the actual buildings and the way the, 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 the patterns of the city will influence the way we think. But, and, and this question of aesthetics for me is super interesting and, and really related to decolonial aesthetics because aesthetics uh, is not only about beauty, right? It's about, about the taste that we have. And I, my question is always, how do we decolonize taste, right? Because that is something that you sometimes can't help, right? You like something because you like it and you can't explain why you like that taste. Even like, even I'm talking about even, at a very uh, a physical level, like tasting of the mouth or tasting of, 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 a, of a car, the taste of, 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 of you know, all, all forms of, uh, all, in all realms of, 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 of life, you're gonna, you like things because you like them and you can't really explain it. And that, how do you decolonize that? Especially um, for folks who, uh, who, who haven't gotten to the point to really do that work, like you said, I was talking about, of, of trying to decolonize, right? For me, in my personal experience, and I've been, to, I've been to the Louvre, I've been to the Vatican, I've seen these art, and it's beautiful art, right? Um, I didn't get to see the, 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 the art that they stole from the third world where they, they, they put in the, in the basement, right? But I did get to see the, the, the European art that, that we, we classify as, you know, these, these masterpieces. But it wasn't really, it wasn't really until, um, you know, I, I was helping uh, at the LRC, actually, I was helping Celia Herrera Rodriguez with her, uh, with, with the, with the uh, exhibit that we're, we're putting up. And she was kind of nonchalantly just passing through her art, trying to figure out which one she wants to put up. And she flipped through one of her pieces and I had such a visceral reaction to it. And I can't explain it, right? I could, and I was like, oh my God, that's a decolonial moment, right? I, I, and I've, I've, seen, I've seen the Mona Lisa, but it wasn't until she just kind of pulled out this random piece and I was like, oh my God, what is going on to my body? And it was amazing. I was like, that, that was like, in retrospect, I was, that was like a healing moment, right? That was a, 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 a de a, almost like a decolonial, a decolonizing aesthetic, right? Because my body felt it. And I started, and, and I really, I, I really started, I think from even from that moment, I was like having a, a, a greater appreciation for a certain kind of art. And I was like, oh, that's me gravitating now towards something because of that, because of something an artist like Celia Herrera Rodriguez uh, produced, right? And I was like, that to me is, is, the process of healing and the process of, of decolonizing. Um, but to get to the second question that Lara, you were mentioning to, uh, uh, that you were asking uh, Isela and, and, um, and Mauricio is, um, what do you think has historically characterized decolonial art? And how do you see the art world responding to the COVID-19 pandemic era? And what is the current political and social crisis doing in the arts world and the arts and the communities and therefore uh, in their art and to art spaces, meaning, uh, like Isela, you spend a lot of time uh, uh, in Chile and Mauricio, you know, spending that time 
or or or, or, or being uh, uh, experiencing or, or being involved with the the Afro diasporic art. How 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 do you see this current moment um, affecting the art world? And this this question can actually be answered by Jesus because I know Jesus, you've been involved in a lot of uh, Bay Area and 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 uh, Southwest uh, circles as well, um, and, and Mexico of course, and Laura uh, you as well. So it's open to anybody actually. I mean, to me, one of the things I have to say, and, and to me, it, um, it's. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll be real quick. And it's, it's just, when we're thinking about the art world, I, I always have to jump in and say, you know, when, when we're thinking about, we, we can look back to the Black Lives Matter movement and the way it started. We can look back to the election of, of, of Trump and we can see the way that, that the art world, and, and I think that this has been kind of a continuation of it with the uprisings, is that the art world will bend to whatever's popular at the time. And so to me, I think one of the things that, that I am always unhappy with the art world and happy at the same time is that they include us is that the art world is always looking for the next big thing, right? For the thing that makes them look unique. And so in a way, I think it's like, you know, when we have the big institutions that all of a sudden are, are like, oh, look, at, look how great all this art of resistance is after the Trump movement. And right now, as, as you know, the cities are burning, the, the, the MoMAs, right? The SF MoMA is one of those, right? Which I, 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 I don't wanna, um, you know, spit at them, right? Um, but spit in their face, but you know, it, it, it is some, somehow it, it does elicit some kind of weird feeling where all of a sudden, you know, brown artists are relevant because the world is burning, right? All of a sudden there's all these things that are happening and maybe this is just the anger that I hold inside because I'm, you know, I think like many of us, I'm angry, but it's, it's a lot of these things that all of a sudden it's in vogue and all of a sudden, oh, let's bring them to bring them in to do a mural, which is great that we get to do a mural at the SF MoMA. But, you know, that should have been, you know, 10 years ago. That should have been 15 years ago. And it was, you know, and to, to, it's always cyclical, right? When we go back to the 90s, we look at the multicultural movement. And that's the last time that it was really great to bring in people of color into these spaces, right? And so to me, that's a thing. But I, I, to me, I think I, I just wanted to, like, um, get that off my, off my bag because it's one of those things that I think is always really problematic as we look to the art world. And, and it, it really always comes back to the community spaces, right? Because those are the ones that are always there that have the artists back and are always, you know, um, I, I, and I'm, I can think back to Galeria de la Raza's FTP for the people, uh, AK Fuck the Police um, exhibit that happened years ago, right before all of this stuff was going on. It was just a response because that's what's happening in our communities. But I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, uh, thank you, Jesus. I, I, I wanted to uh, just illustrate an, an example of what is, you know, uh, what is going on in Chile right now. So Chile had a major rebellion uh, last October, and it's uh, and it was in many ways, um, uh, it, it, it kind of like sort of simmered down with the pandemic, but now it's, it's coming up again. And it's a rebellion that's really um, uh, 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 contesting the continuation of the legacy of the dictatorship, um, the extreme inequality, the, uh, um, uh, and I'm glad that to see that Mapuche mural with the, also the, the, the rebellion dog in, in Oakland, um, because that comes out of that movement, which really, you know, also challenges the ways in which indigenous people in Chile had been erased and, you know, and decimated and continue to be, uh, 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 you know, to, to, to be suffering under that. So now these social movements uh, 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 have pushed the, uh, uh, the powers that be to rethink the constitution, a constitution that was written in times of dictatorship. So now there's going to be a referendum in what, October the 25th, that's how long, that's, you know, that's, you know, less, less than two weeks from now, where Chileans are going to be voting whether to approve the drafting of a new, uh, a new constitution that provides and that assures more rights um, uh, to the Chilean people. Um, uh, or you can vote no. And of course, the political right is like, no, no, we don't, we, we, we don't want to change the constitution. Um, but what is happening in terms of artists, you know, you have these muralist brigades in Chile that were born out of social uh, strife in the late 60s and that are still active today. So the, one of them is the Brigada Ramona Parra that has, that have taken to the streets in times of pandemic. They mass themselves up and they've done all over a hundred murals uh, to promote the approval of a new um, 
of a new constitution. Um, and so this is art of agitation. And this is, I think, central to what I think of is a decolonial aesthetic. So I wanted to share, you know, uh, what is happening in Chile right now uh, with this incredibly active and effervescent um, uh, uh, street art. And I, I also would like to, to make a, a to show an example of uh, what uh, uh, Laura asked about uh, uh, not only the, the situation in Brazil, but also about healing, because uh, in healing now, it's also uh, an important issue in uh, Brazilian art, uh, mainly in the Afro-Brazilian art. Uh, Abraham, can I share my, my screen? Yeah. So yeah, if you if you click uh, share screen, you should have the option, Mauricio. Okay, uh, I'll try just a minute. So uh, can you see? This is the the work of uh, Aiso Heraclito. Aiso Heraclito is here. He is a, a an Afro Brazilian uh, artist and. He is very famous here, and he's also uh, international recognized. And here he he's doing a, a, re, a healing in the Gorei Island. This is the uh, the uh, the slavery uh, house in, in Gorei, and then he's doing a a press a healing practice, a ritual from the candomblé. The candomblé is the uh, Orishas Afro religion in, in Brazil. And uh, it's the same as the Orishas of uh, the Santeria, the Cuban Santeria. And Aiso Heraclito is a, a, a priest of the candomblé and he is doing a, a a uh, reeling ritual called sacudimento. So he's using uh, the, the candomblé knowledge of healing to uh, try to, to do this practice in, in a place of uh, memory of pain, uh, memory of slave, uh, slavery, like this one. And he, he did the same in Brazil at the Valongo Wharf, that was the place that uh, uh, received the largest number of uh, African enslaved uh, of the world. So this practice of, this is a, an example of a, a practice of healing by Afro-Brazilian artists and trying to connect with uh, uh, his ancestrality and the healing practices of his ancestors. So I, I think it's really uh, interesting to to discuss uh, the importance of healing uh, in the the colonial aesthetics because we can see it in Brazil as well and 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 we can see it in in, in places like uh, these places of memory of slavery and trying to, to uh, make practices of healing uh, in, this, uh, in these places where people uh, uh, were uh, uh, totally, uh, uh, they, they lost all his uh, condition to be uh, to all the condition of his of the uh, humanity. So it's it's a uh, it's a press to to the ancestors. So and using this really practices of uh, Candomblé as well. So just to comment the and to bring uh, an example of uh, healing in. Uh, in Brazil, in Afro-Brazilian art, 
and and to connect with uh, the the other examples that uh, uh, you guys uh, brought and in Brazil we are living a a situation uh, similar to US uh, a, a very conservative uh, uh, way to to deal with uh, the the pandemic situation and and here now we are not in totally in in quarantine uh, the place uh, reopen even the the uh, places of the art world and uh, we have a, a art market here called Art Rio and it's uh, it's beginning now and it's open but uh, just to not they are uh, trying to control the, the number of people in this in this kind of uh, event but uh, what I, I can see is that uh, uh, People, Afro-Brazilian uh, artists, indigenous artists, they are, they are trying to uh, use art as a praxis uh, against all these conservative situations that we have here in Brazil. And because we have a huge uh, structural hesses and and so now we are trying with uh, the artworks of these indigenous and black artists to uh, uh, queer artists as well, black queer artists trying to uh, decolonize the museums here, trying to decolonize the uh, uh, space of art and at the same time, the sense of community is is growing a lot uh, in this situation. I have more proximity uh, with uh, uh, black artists, but I am also uh, paying attention at, at the indigenous movement in the uh, in, in, in art practices and. What I can see is they are trying to keep in their communities and using art to be safe and to be together and to create a new and powerful image of this situation. I want to take the question of COVID-19 in the direction of museums. Um, you know, you just mentioned Mauricio Museums, and I've been thinking, you know, about how COVID here in California and probably in other parts of the country, maybe the world too, you know, how it's affecting museums. So we're experiencing in the United States and in California economic crises, of course, right, uh, as a result of, of COVID-19. And... Um, to me, I think one of the, the dangers and one of the challenges is it's taken at least right 50 years for people to struggle, uh, people of color, so that their work can have visibility, so that we could be at universities, so that you know scholars before us could develop, right, just slides and bodies of knowledge, you know, so that we can study them and know about them and begin to incorporate them into really more inclusive accounts, right, of art history or into the holdings of museums. Museums are public spaces. Um, they're also private museums, of course, but public museums are paid for with public tax dollars and with the dollars of the undocumented probably in there as well. And so the danger right now is that we are going to see people being let go because of the economic crises. And these are those moments where in a way you really see 
uh, how knowledgeable and how serious and how committed people are. So that if we're being pressured, like Jesus says, you know, one gets angry if, you know, only when Black Lives Matter happens or only when the huge immigration or only when ethnic studies, you know, struggles to diversify the canon were happening, then there's a little window of, or only on Days of the Dead, then there are these little windows that are very tokenizing. Like you're allowed in during Women's History Month, you're allowed in to celebrate, you know, Hispanic Culture Month or African Culture Month, but are you in the collections? Are you in the exhibitions that are regular? Are you reflected in the staff? You know, are you actually cultivating people that will become directors, right? Uh, I've seen so many times these stories of people saying, well, that's very fascinating, but we don't have that specialization. We don't collect that kind of art. And this is like a liberal, like friendly response. And so one of the things that has really been on my mind, I co-wrote a letter with the artist Amalia Mesa Baines at the Triton Art Museum, which is not far from, um, you know, it's part of the larger Bay Area. Uh, not a large museum, but um, a museum that is in an area that is very heavily populated historically by Latinos, especially Mexican Americans, by Latinos. But California is full of people of color. And so this woman, a curator who worked her way up over 16 years to become a chief curator um, and had shows of different kinds of people of color with the excuse that COVID, you know, was making the museum have to let people go. The decision that's made is to let her go. The only, not only curator of color, her person, but with expertise and study in people of color art. And to me, those are like the moments of where in crises, like in COVID, what are the choices that we're making? We lose so much every time we're not in crises, right? Every time that pressure is not there, then that kind of a Eurocentric universalizing as if all of us have, as if it's enough to study a Eurocentric art history a Euro-American art history, as if that's the most important expertise, instead of understanding we're in a multicultural country. Our foundations have been multicultural, even if that's been denied. And our multiculturality is only going to improve, you know, and increase, you know, and this is true for our world. So, you know, I really feel very strongly that our museums have to show that. You know, I want to do a shout out, by the way, the Berkeley Art Museum has hired a Latina director. This is like historic. You know, she's lived in different parts of the world, in Brazil, in Africa. Her expertise is there. And it's just, I, I really want to say how much I'm, I'm happy because she's known for her support of people of color art globally and, um, and in the United States. And I, I feel that that is a really great direction for uh, UC Berkeley, um, but we have the example of the Triton that has gone in a different direction. So I just wanted to say that these are the moments where we have to make the choices that prioritize a greater democratization of the art world and our education and you know the, the expertise that, that curators have, which is in dominant cultural art, you know, but also in the art of people of color. So that's like an even more powerful education in my view and more relevant. Um, yeah, I, I wanna you know, echo uh, Laura's comments that I think that museums are at a really critical intersection uh, as they see dwindling you know, um, uh, 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 budgets um, uh, that I think we have to be very, um, aware that a lot of times, you know, economic uh, crises, pandemics, that a lot of times those can easily be used as an excuse to not fund, not support, you know, uh, people of color. And we already know that all about how the pandemic has, you know, affected people of color in more severe ways. And so, um, and so I think museums, you know, are at this place where they can uh, uh, make some really critical decisions about either, you know, um, uh, 
maintaining the same kinds of practices um, or actually doing something different. And I, I wanna like give a little shout out to the Wexner Center for the Arts here in uh, Ohio State, uh, which up on, I mean, I've been at Ohio State for like years and it was, it's, it, it, it's only happened in the past, um, I would say four to five years that we're seeing more artists of color. Participate. You know, I had never in, been invited to participate in anything that had to do with the Wexner app until the, you know, the last few years. And so as a result, you see more creative understandings of what a museum can be. Uh, so for example, just a few, uh, a few months ago, we had Puerto Rican um, uh, uh, artists, feminist performance artists, uh, Awilda Rodriguez Lora do a virtual re residency where we could drop by her studio through the you know through the interface and see her uh, performing um, works from her own house and engaging us in conversation and 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 it was also an opportunity for her to talk about you know the you know the colonial status of Puerto Rico and uh, and the ways in which the Trump administration has kind of exacerbated this um you know uh this kind of uh, colonial relationship that it has with the u.s nation state and so uh so i think uh let's keep an eye on what museums are doing and let's keep pressure on them as well thank you isela i think um we're running at uh 30 minutes until uh, uh, till the end of the, the, the hour. So I think it's a good time to break into some of the questions that, um, that we have here in the Q&A. We have a question by, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, it's uh, Dr. Charles Briggs. Uh, he asks, uh, this is an amazing conversation. I feel honored to be a participant I would love to hear more about this complex confrontation between the violence of colonial aesthetics and the healing power of decolonial aesthetics. Where does healing, where does healing power lie at this terribly junk, at this terrible, terrible juncture? Where do we, where do we look into aesthetic details? Should we focus on the often commodifying and sometimes anti-capitalism power of context, museums, galleries, film studios? street art murals, memes, and the aesthetics of acts of everyday care that can oppress or sustain people. To return to the title, is there a decolonial aesthetics of vernacular care in confronting the way Latinx communities are targeted in the COVID-19 pandemic? I guess, you know, just, I don't know if this is totally on, um, but to me, you know, I, you know, one of the things that I think is really brilliant in the way this whole thing is kind of brought together has been, you know, the response on the streets, because I think, you know, as we look, I think one, as we look to the uprisings, I, I think, you know, we, we have to understand that, although those, those, to me, in the same way that I think about ceremony and, and thinking about that kind of somehow being tied to the aesthetic, I even have to think that in, in that same way, the, the uprising, because I see that as some form of, of ceremony. It, it's, it's, you know, Whenever we're, we're burning down the structure of colonialism, there is a ceremony of undoing there, right? And I think that's one of those things that, that really has to kind of be touched on, right? So we're thinking of these uprisings as, as you know, as I, I hate to say it, as, but as performance art, as we would, as, you know, it's the best way sometimes to, to think about the, these acts that come from another kind of worldview to bring them into the, the art world, right? This is, you know, a performance art, you know, this is, and not to say that it's staged or anything like that, but because it, it's that, that very real piece of, of being in these people that, that kind of brings these acts, right? It's, it brings, you know, the, the, as, as I remember seeing, you know, the, the windows of the, uh, of the Chase in downtown Oakland being smashed, right? After, after Chase had put up these boards to, you know, to block this from happening, the people went with power tools, took down the boards, smashed in the windows. And I, went in and, 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 and yeah, they went in and, and did things, right? And to me, I think in, this, in that same way, it's kind of, you know, the, the way the artwork has been kind of shared, right? And I think to me, it's really looking at the way that the artists, as, as we think, as, as, as Ansal Dua starts to, to kind of think of them as those medicine people that come and, and give us that healing, right? It's, it's, you know, without sometimes even knowing about it, I think that's what it's been. It's been the way that we've had, you know, and I think, you know, Abraham showed a lot of that art 
at the beginning and, and I'll, I'll just go into one of them, but you know, we have, you know, all of this, this work that that's happening out there. And I think that to me is, is, you know, there's one right here um, that I wanted to just show real quick. Um, this piece by Trust Your Struggle, um, along with, um, along with Ruth Healing, right? Uh, C.C. Caprio kind of being the, the artist here and, and looking at the way that, that the art was brought to, to the streets, right? And the way that the people came out with, um, with that spirituality, right? That spiritual component, put up that altar. And I think this was part of it, right? Because we're talking about the visual and, and although, you know, I think we're, t you know, we're t touching on the healing, right? And I think that's been one of the ways that, you know, the streets has, has become that gallery, I think, because, you know, we, we've been able to, to look to all these spaces, we can look to the moment, and they're doing their thing, and, and I don't want to disrespect them too much, right? But I, I think they're trying, right? But really what it is, is the streets that have become the gallery, the, the museum for all of these things, right? For the artists to be able to share their, their thoughts on this work, right? And so that's, that's what happened in Oakland. And so as, as we have this space, right? This is a place where people are able to come out and to, to put down this altar, right? To put down the many altars that went out there. I think that's one of the things that was very magical about this moment is that we had the uprising, but we also had that moment of healing where people were coming together and having these ceremonies on the streets, right? Because, you know, I, I, I also have to think about this as, as you know, we are a, a people in diaspora. We are a people who have lost our homeland and we don't have those ceremonial spaces other than indigenous people. And even those like the Ohlone here in the Bay Area, they have lost their, their own ceremonial spaces. If we look around the Oakland, we, you, we, we can actually pinpoint where their, their, uh, their village sites were, where their uh, shell mounds were, their burial sites were, and, and how all those have been covered up and be, have become freeways, uh, shopping malls or whatever, right? So we no longer have, the, have those spaces. So for us as people in diaspora, we've had to create these spaces. We've had to go out to the streets and we've had to take over these spaces and put our, our, you know, our, our murals up, our images up, our, our altars down. And that's where we've been able to, to as people, activate those spaces, right? We, we think about art, we always think about the activation of it, right? And I think that's where, you know, the prayer happens. That's what's, what's activating these works, right? It's, it's, you know, we also see that the protest as part of activating these works, right? Because I think without the, the actual action, right, these, these images that are put up have, have no real meaning. It's the people who give these images meaning by their actions and, and, and actually taking to the streets and demanding change, right? When change has, has been so slowly given to us, right? And to, to, to demand radical change. And, and it's in a way that the art and, and action work together in this kind of back and forth. They serve as inspiration for people to go out, right? In the same way that the, the, the uprising serve as inspiration for the artists to make this work. So I think to me, that's, you know, we can, we can look to, I think there's a beautiful piece I mentioned, uh, Mar Marina Paris Wong, uh, a mission, uh, mission district artist who was um, commissioned by the SF MoMA to do a beautiful piece, right? That's one of those pieces that we can look at to see about the uprising, right? But here we have, you know, the streets where as artists, we're able to do that. I want to add something very brief to what uh, Jesus said when he was talking about the ceremonial and the performative and how that takes us into that space of healing and decoloniality. And I also want to say that what is um, particularly powerful about the ceremonial and the, um, uh, and the performative is that it is ephemeral, it is in many ways um, it is very difficult to commodify. I'm not going to say impossible because we all know Marina Abramovich. I, I never know how to pronounce her name, the famous performance artist. You know, because you know, it is in the in the commodification of art with the rise of the auction houses that we see that continuation of the uh, to, to cite, cite Mauricio here of the coloniality of art. That because that's also a possibility. And so I think for a lot of Latinx, Indigenous, African descent people, uh, you know, the performative and the ceremonial is so important for its healing and spiritual elements, but also because of the ways in which these resist the commodification uh, and that turning the art object into a capitalist product. So just wanted to say that. I would just also add in response to uh, Charles Briggs's question, you know, um, I, I was thinking as I was listening, you know, to everyone's responses so far, 
like how do we think about the decolonial, especially at such a terrible moment? And I was thinking of um, how in the 60s and the 70s, and then during the HIV AIDS crises, uh, which was also very racialized, right? The HIV crises really hit our people of color communities really badly, in part because information and medical services were not targeted to them and they they had the least amount of resources today covid um today covid as the newspapers have made very clear is really hitting uh people of color communities uh latinos and african americans among them but also by the way the millennial generation all of those people who have to go out and work you know, as essential workers and the, who are in the service industry, restaurants have been reopening, et cetera. The, all of these people are at great risk. And so anyway, going back to what I was saying before, I was thinking about how these two other previous historical moments where people of color and other vulnerable communities don't see themselves represented. I have to grab my cord. I just saw the red battery. <laughs> They don't see themselves represented. And so the decolonial aspect of that work or the political aspect of the work is, is that the question gets refocused again. Who is this work serving and who is it addressing? And I remember talking to art history friends, you know, who thought that making murals in the 60s and 70s was a sign of like, oh, these people haven't been to art school but all those people had been to art school. It was a choice to make murals in order to make them among the community, to address the needs of the community, to express the voice of the community, to keep the community company, to, as someone famously said, to bring the museums to the street, right? And something that Gisela has written quite, about, quite a lot about in her studies about muralism or street art, right? And so I saw one thing um, which uh, that had to do with COVID. And it was actually a mural um, not far from where I live in Richmond. And it was a mural that had a mask and it was instructing the community in Spanish to wear their masks, you know? And so I can see like people having some kind of debate, like, is it art or was it just an instruction that's visual, you know? And I, I you know, I think we're, we're going to have to take a look and document what people are doing right now to address COVID. But I do know that the US Latino community is on our campus at UC Berkeley. We're really thinking about this issue and trying to see accountability happen in the community. How are we protecting our essential workers, our custodial workers? our students you know the majority of our students are first generation uh, there th those who are at home one of my students half the family was in quarantine in their house so there are so many the racialization of COVID and and I think all pandemics and all diseases affect our communities differently and I think it's personally I think it's really powerful and beautiful and necessary when our artists um, speak out to what our community's needs are and do that in a really visual way. I think we're going to have to keep on watching to see what the artists are doing. Jesus is also an artist of, of uh, and I remember at the beginning of COVID in the spring, Jesus, you were telling me about some of the creativity you were figuring out, like what to do to like send art out, you know, and I think like we're going to be finding, hearing out a lot more about what our artists of color are doing to reach the community. You also sent me an image from one of your students who is doing this image with a, like a, I think it was a Day of the Dead, like a, whatever those things are called, las tapacaras, you know? Anyway, just to. Yeah, which, um, which leads me to this question that was asked by uh, an anonymous person uh, do the symbols of the internet age, such as the hashtags or memes, empower or hinder the process of decolonization and our understanding of related, re related aesthetics and semiotics? And how does this affect Latinx epistemological constructs of world and self? Open question. I mean, I'm 
And we've already uh, seen how social media has participated in social in in, in you know in social justice movements, um, and so so I think that you know of course that's a very powerful tool, but um, at the same time, uh, and this is something that we've been I think uh, those of us in the fields of ethnic gender studies we've been talking about how of course that's insufficient you know that you know. You know, it's very easy to, you know, uh, post, you know, um, hashtags, say her name, and then just walk away. And so it needs to come, you know, together with social action. And it also needs to come with, I think, a critical perspective on how, you know, online cultures have also exacerbated a lot of uh, racial inequalities. It has given this platforms for hate speech. Um, and so, so I think, you know, that uh, we need to be, we, we need to, you know, I don't think we need to be afraid of it necessarily, but at the same time, we need to be critical and we need to also, uh, you know, connect our, you know, our hacktivism or our, you know, um, our online activism with praxis, you know, with, you know, with actions that, uh, that go beyond posting a hack. Hashtag. Um, and so I think that that's something um, that I think is important when we are thinking about, you know, what can we do like through memes and hashtags and uh, retweets, tweets and retweets. And of course we have to, uh, and what, what makes us more aware of how social media can be used in destructive ways than the person of the United States, you know, spreading hate through his social media account. One of the things that I, I think is, is interesting as we, we think about the internet and, and Laura kind of brought up, it, it's, 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 you know, the, as you said, I was getting, you know, there, there's a lot, you know, that, that's amazing about the internet, but I think you said, you know, there needs to be action behind the, the hashtags, right? We can't just, you know, you have a lot of posting and it's like, it becomes the internet activism, right? But it, it, it's, it's difficult because there, there's also some of that, um, there's, there's been a, a lot of conscious racing going on. I think that's one of the things that we can really give to the internet where it allows for people to, to learn about things. Uh, in the same way that in the 60s, the movement re really relied on the newspapers, on the student newspapers and all that. So it's kind of a, another version of that, right? In the same way that Ospad was sending out the Tricontinental. Right now we have the internet. We can find out what's going on in Palestine. We can see what's happening in Vietnam, right? In the same way that we could through, through the... Um, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's hard, but I, I, one of the things that definitely, you know, thinking about it, this kind of louder made me think of, you know, this year we're, um, we have a class at Cal, uh, Spirituality as Resistance, and every year that, that class that I teach, uh, we put together um, the Los Muertos exhibit. And this year, because of COVID, we're not able to do that. We're not able to, to take that, you know, into the normal place that we do. And so we're having to take that online, you know, and, and it, it's a trippy thing because when I feel really sad for the students, because it, it's, it's uh, uh, one of the best things uh, our, our program offers is that I think students love having that exhibit and it allows them the opportunity to, you know, to come from, you know, majors who are doing computer science to be able to do an artwork and have an exhibit, right? And this year we're having to do that online, right? So it's, it's almost, it's a trip because we're, you know, I, I always think about the, that, that as being part of the kind of the decolonial. It's part of that thing that we've taken on as being a people in diaspora and having to use that, that to reconnect to our roots, right? And so this is one of the first times that, you know, we, we are doing things. Usually that, that idea is that when you're doing ceremony, when you have these, these kind of altars, that I, traditionally you're not supposed to photograph these things. You're not supposed to put them online, you know, when it's really frowned upon, you know, when you have ceremony and you, you take it online and this time that's the only way we can share it. You know, you look at self-help graphics, you look at Mission Cultural Center, um, the, the two flagships, right, that in, in, in California, they usually lead the Dialogos Muertos exhibitions. They're both having to take it online. They can open up to the people. So it's almost a weird thing where we're having to address, you know, and I'm, I'm really interested to see how these exhibitions are going to come up because they're, they're you know, they're, they're having to address, you know, the elephant in the room, all the people who died from COVID, right? And so to me, it's just like, you know, what's, what, what how's that going to be? And so it's interesting because this year, um, a good friend of mine, an, an, an artist, uh, Nancy Hernandez, is going to lead the um, one one of the uh, 
one of the altares happening at the Mission Cultural Center, and then that's going to be recorded by, you know, the actual installation of that and the creation of the altar is going to be recorded and broadcast on KQED. So it's, we're almost having to rethink our connection to these artworks, right, and the way that we see them, right, and how do we share them into a different way where this year, you know, the online and, and social media platforms are the way that we're able going we're going to be able to connect. And the way I see, you know, is, is that, you know, as, as Dia los Muertos, as a ceremony in diaspora, we've had to change the way it functions from the way it functioned in Mexico, because we don't have those, those ceremonies, right? Um, the, the, we don't have the cemeteries that we can go to as, as a community and, and mourn our dead. Here, it became the thing where we have our, our, our exhibition spaces, like the Galeria on Self-Help, where we're able to go and connect as community. And we don't have that this year. We're going to have to do that online. And um, we're seeing how even you see Santa Barbara with Celia Rodriguez out there, Celia Rodriguez out there is setting up a ceremony in our house to kind of broadcast over Zoom to have people connect and to have dance over Zoom and to have the altar over Zoom that we're going to bring in. And so it, it, it's, it's a trippy thing, right? And I, I've just, to, to, to close it up, I'm going to share this one image that um, Laura mentioned. This is going to be part of the publicity for our, our exhibition here at Cal. And just, you know, what, what does it mean, you know, for artists to get creative and to do different things, right? This is, this is going to be, this is going to be um, the, the digital, part of the digital friends that we do. And so the artist is envisioning this as a Zoom window. So it's going to be, um, this is going to be the central window of the Zoom meeting with all the ancestors in the, um, in the surrounding window. So it's, it's almost even though as, as artists are, are having to rethink the way that we do things, you know, so how do we envision, you know, uh, a new reality within this, this COVID reality of, of having to do everything online and work within the digital. Yeah. Yeah. And here in in Brazil, in, in Rio de Janeiro, in the beginning of the the pandemic, we 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 have here a traditional uh, exhibition of our uh, students' artworks, and this year we we was thinking how to do it. And we decided to do it uh, in a, a virtual exhibition. And for sure, the, the space of internet is very complex, very difficult to say if it's good or it's bad. So, but at the same time, we, we, you can have uh, both situations, depends of how to deal with this platform and then the idea of uh, uh, produce an exhibition a virtual exhibition with the students uh, were very interesting because we are thinking how to make an exhibition totally online how can we see the the artworks uh, in the screen in the of the the uh, computer how can we have this conversation with the students as artists? Uh, a lot of our students are uh, people of color and black people, people, student that uh, uh, comes from the periphery of Rio. And then we also have a huge problem of connective connectivity here and people have difficulties to access internet and then at the same time this uh, uh, exhibition online that we were constructing was important to uh, keep us together to understand what's going on with our students and they uh, had this opportunity to uh, to use art to connect us in this uh, pandemic situation. So it's just a, a, a comment on, on this uh, difficult to to say uh, how you can use the the internet to. Uh, produce, for example, 
the colonial aesthetics? So it's a, a good question, but at the same time, suddenly we uh, look around and we realize that we need to do something. We need to still make art. We still so how to do it in in this situation? And I think the internet it's not a, an answer, but it's a. a, a advice to think these possibilities. And I think we will have to still think on it after this pandemic uh, situation. Thank you, Mauricio. We have, we have uh, about five minutes. Uh, uh, um, I think I'm going to read two questions and then maybe uh, the panelists can give short uh, answers if you, uh, if you can. So we have one here uh, from Clara Mantini Briggs in Spanish. Uh, gracias por tan fabuloso reunión en cuanto al arte y de la descolonización que se piensa acerca del arte en América Latina. ¿Qué es el llamado arte popular fo folclórico y en respuesta a situaciones políticas denominado arte ingenuo? en comparación con el arte eurocéntrico, podrían hacer un comentario. Um, what's popular art, folkloric art, uh, in response to the, uh, to the political situation or to the art that is considered uh, simplistic art in comparison to art, eurocentric art? Can you answer? Uh, can you make a comment? And then the second question here is from Daniel Marquez. Uh, Abraham, you mentioned that visceral feeling when looking at Celia's art. Uh, the, time, the, uh, the time I felt that visceral feeling of healing was when I was reading a piece on the concept of Ignal by Juan Castillo Cocom. My question to the panelists is, is there a decolonial concept or framework that helps describe or understand this feeling? This feeling of coming across a piece of art or literature that makes you feel closer to where colonized or racialized diasporic people are supposed to be. How do you all understand that feeling? And is there a decolonial concept that could help us understand that? Open question. And we have about four minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw into it. I mean, really, I mean, kind of specifically around Daniel's question to me, um, when, you know, I always go back to healing, right? So to me, there, there is something that connects us. And, and you know, so many people, when I, I love conceptual art and I love contemporary art, I love conceptual art because at, at the heart of it is this, this, this kind of bringing together of all of these referentials, all of these references, right? And to me, I think when it comes to people who hate contemporary art, hate conceptual art, it's because they don't understand it, right? And so one of the things when it comes to the decolonial and even to, to that, that kind of art that comes from our community, it's really about the, refer the, the references that we use. And I think that's at the heart of how people are able to understand it. When you go in to see an artwork and you see yourself in it, where you see, you know, yourself connected to it, and you still have to put all the pieces together and understand, you know, what, what the artist is, is trying to get you to, to understand and to think about, you know, that's really where all of a sudden you connect. And I think that's really, it's really about the pieces that are brought in together. Right? And I think that's, that's to me, the, one of the things that like installation art is really um, to me at the heart of a lot of the decolonial because it's bringing together all these things that, uh, and I, I think about the work of, of Amalia Mesa Baines where we can look at uh, some of the installations that she's done, right? Where she's bringing all these pieces together and she helps us understand, you know, what it is that we're, move, we're, we're delinking from and what is it that we're moving towards, right? We're delinking from the European, from the Western, all of these ideas in her eye and in some of her senses from the church and what is she uh, linking towards, right? She's moving towards in thinking of uh, the Venus Assembly piece, looking at Kualikwe, right? Looking at, at the mirror where you see yourself and you see Kualikwe, right? And so to me, I think that's one of those things is, is the references that we're able to understand and connect to and, and see ourselves. And to me, that's a simple answer for me. But I'll read. Um, I, I want to say just very briefly respond to Clara's uh, uh, question about um, the folkloric and the um, uh, and, uh, uh, and lo popular in, in Latin America that I think when we're talking about the ways in which indigenous peoples uh, 
art uh, get put into this category of the folkloric, you get into this whole idea of the tourist gaze, of, of, uh, of indigenous art only being useful uh, if it falls within this, you know, mercados folkloricos that you see throughout Latin America. Uh, and that uh, we have to, you know, obviously be very critical of that, that market of commodities where, you know, uh, Latin American or, or where the indigenous expressions of Latin America, uh, uh, in Latin America get sort of co-opted. And so um, this is not to say that there's some wonderful things that come out of this, you know, uh, of this folkloric uh, uh, sort of aesthetic, but, you know, I think that, you know, we have to be very um, cautious about this tourist gaze that tends to co-opt indigenous and African descent people's art, actually. You know, I, I'll also just throw in just for a moment um, uh, that I, I think we're going to have to do a lot of rethinking, you know, about these categories, you know, when, when people, have, when women weren't sitting at the table, men could imagine whatever they wanted, like Freud, like about what women want and what women are. And then women come to the table and knowledge is much more expansive and much more accurate. When people of color are no longer the object of study of the West, you know, then we have things to say. When minorities are no longer, you know, uh, marginalized and we can come to the table, we have things to say. So these categories that we've inherited about, you know, que uh, constituye lo folclorico, right? What is it that constitutes the folkloric? Well, one branch of thinking is that the folkloric is created uh, to kind of sell an idea of a particular Latin American nation. Hey, this is Bolivian folkloric art. This is Mexican folkloric dance. I think that, you know, that there's some fascinating people have done amazing, wonderful work about that. But then people also absorb any time, like it, let's say that a Chicano person, you know, a Chicano artist uses a pre-Columbian image or that an African diasporic person makes a reference to like uh, a African, um, home culture, right? D again, does that constitute folklore and nostalgia and like not having, you know, enough education in the art world to make like a more quote unquote sophisticated choice? So that very divide between what constitutes naive work in trabajo in Kenwo, right? Naive work and less skilled work and supposedly less intentional work and supposedly less conceptual work. I think those things really look different the more we sit at the table and think about them, you know? Like, because something is not about, you know, how, how realistic can I make a sculpture or a painting, you know? Uh, because those might not be the, those might not be the compass that are being used uh, or how conceptual and abstract, those might not be the compass that are being asked, you know, of materials and how to work with them. So I think it's a great, great question. And yeah, my response is that we just have to really think about what it is that's, that's being um, in a way judged and what is the standard that's being used to judge and what is the, you know, to my, as much as we can know, and sometimes we can't, uh, to whom or what are pieces being directed, right? Um, such a large and wonderful question, but you know, at least to give some response to it. Uh, yes, and as Gisela uh, said, uh, for us in, in Latin America, the, the issue of popular is a huge debate. We have a lot of uh, a huge debate on, on this because sometimes the problem uh, with the categories is the uh, it's uh, it can be used useful to the this coloniality of art say who is popular who is folkloric and who is saying this, uh, who has the authority to say which art is popular, which art is uh, folkloric, and why 
to have these categories. Sometimes, um, most of the times here in, in Brazil, for example, when we uh, when people say that these are popular arts, they are saying that it's worse than uh, uh, modern art, than uh, contemporary art. So that is the problem with these categories because it can be useful for this uh, coloniality of art and at the same time can be useful to uh, resist to this uh, hegemonic and Eurocentric and uh, this uh, coloniality of art. Well, I think we're over uh, six o'clock, but I think it's a good time here to wrap up. Um, I, uh, I want to uh, thank the panelists, uh, the brilliant uh, Dr. Mauricio Bajos de Castro, and uh, Dr. Isela La Torre. Uh, uh, please read her book, uh, uh, multiple books. And uh, the, the always genius Jesus Barraza, check out his art. Uh, his classes are phenomenal. Um, and uh, my, my brilliant mentor and, uh, and, and uh, uh, professor in ethnic studies, Laura Perez, read her book. Uh, phenomenal work. Uh, uh, she just came out with uh, a book on uh, Eros ideologies and uh, decolonial uh, spirit, decolonial art and spirituality. It's an amazing book. I recommend it. Um, check out Revista Noh. The you're gonna see some of some of these uh, themes in that uh, coming out November first. We're gonna have an article by Jesus. We're also gonna review Laura's book and Mauricio's uh, interview with uh, Rupert Garcia will be in there. And we're gonna have spoken word poetry. Uh, we're gonna have manifestos on children's literature. It's gonna be an amazing issue. Uh, Revista Noh. Thank you for all the, the participants who asked questions, who sat here, uh, engaged us. Uh, thank you to, to everyone. Uh, I'll see you in the next LRC event. Muchas gracias. No escucho nada.